Human consciousness, that's the riddle. What is consciousness for? And why did it evolve? Sometimes I've thought there's no way of getting to an answer. You take this way or that. This one's a blind alley. That one leads back where you began. Consciousness is a mystery and a problem. Perhaps the biggest remaining problem in philosophy and biology too. I want to get as close to an answer as I can. I mean by consciousness, the inner picture we each have of what it is like to be ourselves. Self-awareness, the presence in each of us of a spirit, a self, a soul, which we call I. It's I who have thoughts and feelings, sensations, memories, desires. My body may be fast asleep, but I persist. Perhaps at this very moment, I'm dreaming. This is the person I call I. He's thinking, thinking about what it might feel like not to have this kind of inner consciousness. Presumably, it wouldn't feel like anything at all. Machines don't feel things. They just do things. There's surely no sense in which machines are self-aware. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. In the 17th century, the French philosopher Descartes wondered whether there was anything he or anyone else could be absolutely sure of. Yes, he could be sure that he had conscious thoughts and feelings. The one and only solid fact was the presence of the ghost in the machine. Consciousness is a part of human nature. But for Descartes, it was more than that. It was a sign of our closeness to God. No other animal had been thus favored. My dog, in Descartes' view, not only lacks a soul, he completely lacks a conscious mind. I used to think that Descartes' ideas were nonsense. Surely consciousness and the brain's activity are inseparably linked. How could we act at all if we weren't conscious? Then in Cambridge in the 1960s, I became involved in an experiment which quite shook me up and made me take nothing in this area for granted anymore. This monkey, Helen, is acting as if she can see but the part of her brain which would allow her to see in the way we understand seeing has been destroyed. Some years before I took this film, Helen's visual cortex was removed as part of a study of the effects of brain damage in human beings. But the lower centers of her brain were still intact, 
and I thought it just possible she might possess a capacity for vision of which she herself was unaware. I coaxed her and encouraged her. I played with her and took her for walks in the fields near the laboratory. I tried in every way to persuade her that she wasn't blind. By now she could steer her way deftly between obstacles and pick up tiny bits of chocolate from the floor. To a stranger, she'd have appeared to be quite normal. I was sure she wasn't normal. I knew her too well, knew how much effort her recovery had cost her. I was beginning to think that Helen was in a strange way unaware of her own capacity for vision. Here perhaps was an example of an animal behaving quite unconsciously. Are you ready? Trial number 33. Good. And then, a few years later, the possibility of unconscious vision was confirmed, remarkably, in human beings themselves. Okay, shut your eyes. Trial number 35. Graham's eyes are perfectly normal, but he had a car accident which damaged part of the visual centers of his brain. So far as he is concerned, he has no awareness of seeing anything over to his right-hand side. Astonishingly, his brain can still see things in the blind half of his field of vision. He says he's just guessing where the object is. But he gets it right nearly every time. Consciously, he's blind. These blind sight cases are a little disturbing. They demonstrate more dramatically than any logical argument that Descartes might have been right all along. Behavior and consciousness don't necessarily go together. The fact that a man or an animal is acting as if he were conscious is no guarantee that he is. Maybe the idea is not so peculiar. Many people know what it's like to drive a car without being conscious of the route. Some of us, perhaps, have walked in our sleep. A sleepwalker may do quite complicated things and even hold a simple conversation without waking up. Even when we're awake, much of our behavior may be more automatic than we realize. And if Freud was right, what about the ever-present influence of our subconscious minds? Someone may behave as if they are in love and yet deny it. They may be influenced by terrible memories they can't recall. They act accordingly and don't know why. But if that's so, if much of behavior, and perhaps in principle all of it, could occur unconsciously, what is consciousness doing? Why do we have it at all? Some scientists have claimed that consciousness is no more than a meaningless side product of the brain's activity. Once the machinery is in motion, the music plays, and the sounds themselves have no influence on the machinery. Perhaps, like a mechanical piano, our brains just happen to sing out a conscious tune, for no purpose, just music in the air. Imagine a machine equipped with sophisticated sensors and a truly complex electronic brain. It could have instincts, memories, the ability to learn, predict, and take decisions. Surely it could appear to be conscious of its thoughts and feelings. But if a machine can duplicate an animal's behavior, then logically, who's to say that animals themselves are not in fact unconscious machines that just happen to be made of living tissue? And if we choose to believe otherwise, isn't that only because we human beings are incorrigibly sentimental?
Of course, we are inclined always to be generous and to see evidence of consciousness even where there's nothing to confirm it. But sentiment apart, there's really no compelling reason to suppose that termites, for example, are anything other than unconscious robots, soft machines. No one yet knows how to build a beetle. But are the engineering principles insuperable? Even with a chameleon, suppose a mechanical genius set out to make one, there'd be no need to introduce any radically new principle into the design, no need to introduce a conscious mind. Does a cheetah look in on itself and notice its own states of mind? Does the cheetah feel exhilaration and the antelope feel pain? When an animal is fighting for its life, it may indeed behave as if it's feeling trapped or terrified. But to behave in a terrified way and to be consciously aware of feeling terrified are two quite different things. The same must go for pain. What we know is that animals show pain behavior. They struggle, cry, try to avoid the same thing happening again. Biologically, one of the first tasks of an animal's nervous system is to help protect its owner from further injury. Pain behavior must have evolved very early on, but that doesn't mean that conscious awareness evolved with it. No one can doubt that the fish's brain is signaling for all it's worth that something's badly wrong. The alarm bells must be ringing, telling the fish's body to take action. But when a shop window is broken or the building catches fire, the alarm bells also ring. No one thinks that the shop is feeling pain. Do we have to believe that this fish is in any way consciously aware of what's going on. Descartes might well have said, I suffer, therefore I am. Pain is so overwhelmingly real an experience to human beings that it must seem absurd to ask whether or not other creatures share it. What would be missing if people felt no pain? Perhaps nothing except this. We wouldn't understand our own or anyone else's suffering unless we'd felt it ourselves, thought about it, reflected on it. We might never be able to guess what pain behavior means. Does that begin to suggest a use for consciousness, a possible answer to what human consciousness is for? Darwin published The Origin of Species in 1859. Ever since then, to ask what something is for has had a very particular significance. Almost everything in nature has a purpose. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is by far the best explanation of how things in nature have come to be the way they are. The millions of variations of structure, color, behavior and so on that occur in the natural world are all there for a good reason and the reason is survival. In the competition for food, mates and the rearing of offspring, random mutations which benefit the organism are preserved, any others are lost. So everything that's been kept on, and that means everything we find today, is there because it works. Few people have been prepared to ask how consciousness might fit into this Darwinian scheme. Like Descartes, Darwin believed at one time that consciousness must be in some way supernatural, a God-given addition to the general order, and therefore outside the scope 
of scientific explanation. But if Darwin was right about the evolution of everything else, then surely consciousness can be examined in the same light as any other natural faculty or structure, like horns or claws. If consciousness evolved by natural selection, it must be bringing some kind of biological advantage. And that means it must be making some practical difference to our lives. I had a, a great friend of mine as a master at Snow. What's the most difficult thing that people have to do? Surely it's to deal with the most complex, unpredictable, and potentially self-interested creatures on the earth, other human beings. It was she who divorced me. I, I thought that was the reason for a Everyone has to be a skilled psychologist just to stay alive, let alone to negotiate a maze of personal relationships. And yet everyone does it all the time, without giving it a thought. Is that the clue to what consciousness is for? Understanding other people is a remarkable business. Consider, for example, what it means simply to be in conversation with another human being. Well, why, why do you think that is? I mean, why is that? I mean, is it just because people are, are lazy today or they're bored? I mean, are we just like bored, spoiled children who've just been lying in the bathtub all day, just playing with their plastic duck, and now they're just thinking, well, what can I do? Okay, yes, we are bored. We're all bored now. But has it ever occurred to you, Wally, that the process that creates this boredom that we see in the world now may very well be a self-perpetuating, unconscious form of brainwashing? Without consciousness, language itself is hardly conceivable let alone the easy and commonplace exchange of mental concepts, as subtle as boredom, say, or brainwashing. And somebody who's asleep will not say no? See, I keep meeting these people. I mean, uh, just a few days ago, I met this man whom I greatly admire. He's a Swedish physicist, Gustav Bjornstrand, and he told me that he no longer watches television, he doesn't read newspapers, and he doesn't read magazines. He's completely cut them out of his life because he really does feel that we're living in some kind of Orwellian nightmare now. A nightmare. What's a nightmare? So many of our words seem to refer to things which aren't public property, but exist only in our heads. Thoughts, dreams, moods. Remarkably, one person understands what another person means. Where are you from? And I said, New York. He said, ah, New York, yes, that's a very interesting place. Do you know a lot of New Yorkers who keep talking about the fact that they want to leave but never do? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, why do you think they don't leave? I gave him different banal theories, he said. Theories about other people. Theories about ourselves. The very idea of being oneself is a peculiar concept. Imagine a language which didn't contain the one word, I. Imagine a conversation in which you couldn't rely on the other person being an I and sharing all these psychological ideas, pride, hope, interest, fear of death. See, I think it's quite possible that the 1960s represented the last burst of the human being before he was extinguished, and that this is the beginning of the rest of the future now, and that from now on, there'll simply be all these robots walking around, feeling nothing, thinking nothing, and there'll be nobody left almost to remind them that there once was a species called a human being with feelings and thoughts, and that history and memory... Are so we share a common language of the mind, we interpret other people as familiar bodies and familiar souls. Everyone is a natural psychologist, yes. But how do human beings learn so much about human psychology so quickly, within a few years of birth? How do we do it? It's one thing to notice the external facts, another to read beneath the surface and make sense of what we see. We have to make a picture a conceptual model of what goes on inside a human mind to be able to see the hidden presence of plans, intentions, emotions, memories. Only then can we claim to understand the behavior of our fellow human beings. But where could such a model come from? A model of the human mind must be, in effect, 
a model of the human brain. And the human brain is unimaginably complex, probably the most complex mechanism in the universe. Is it really at all likely that any ordinary person could build up a model of the brain just by intelligent observation of how human beings behave? Would anyone ever have the time, the patience, or the scientific genius it would undoubtedly require? The history of academic psychology makes it quite clear that it can't be done that way. Pavlov was convinced that both human and animal behavior could be studied entirely from outside. The future for scientific psychology lay in making endless careful observations of how animals and people respond to external stimuli under laboratory conditions. From the data, it should be possible to construct theoretical models of the workings of the brain, models which might account for everything which could be seen from the outside. For Pavlov and the later behaviorists, the great thing was strict objectivity. Scientifically, the approach was impeccable in intention and design. Practically, it didn't get very far. No amount of outside observation could ever tell me what things taste like or what it's like to read a book. I never have stayed on the outside. If I understand this situation, it's not from looking at, it's from looking in upon myself. By ignoring insight, the behaviorists were ignoring the most powerful tool imaginable for doing psychology, an inner eye which looks in on our own brains. Imagine the brain of an unconscious animal. It's connected to sense organs which monitor the outside world and to effector organs which allow it to operate in and on its environment. But still, this animal is unconscious. It has no insight into anything that's happening inside its brain. Now imagine that at some time in history, a new kind of sense organ evolves, an inner eye, whose field of view is the workings of the brain itself. It summarizes and reports back to the brain on how the brain itself is operating. That's consciousness. That's what we seem to have. Every intelligent action is accompanied by the awareness of the thought processes involved. Every perception by an accompanying sensation, every emotion by a feeling. Yet how strange it is. My thoughts and feelings don't seem to be a picture of my brain. If a scientist were to look inside my head, he'd find millions of nerve cells passing electrical impulses to and fro. What I see with my inner eye is me, my conscious self. By a kind of magical translation, I'm shown my own brain states as conscious states of mind. I'm presented with a picture of my brain which I can understand. Suppose we human beings are the only animals in nature to have evolved this kind of inner eye. What would it mean for our ability to understand behavior? It would mean that each of us has literally a head start in reading our own minds. More than that, this inner picture we have of why and how we act could form the basis for explaining other people too. We could imagine what it's like to be them because we know what it's like to be ourselves. There's a painting by Ilya Repin that hangs in a Moscow gallery. How do we as natural psychologists read a scene like this? The 
painting has the title, They Did Not Expect Him. This is how I find myself interpreting it. A man, still in his coat, dirty boots, enters a drawing room. The maid is apprehensive. She could close the door, but she doesn't. She wants to see how he's received. The grandmother stands, alarmed, as though she's seen a ghost. The younger woman, eyes wide, registers delighted disbelief. The girl, taking her cue from the grown-ups, is suddenly shy. Only the boy shows open pleasure. Who is he? Perhaps the father of the family. Where's he been? The man's eyes, tired and staring, tell of a nightmare from which he's only beginning to awake. The painting represents, as it happens, a Russian political prisoner who's been released from the Tsar's jails and come back home. On the waterfront is a great film. Take out the soundtrack and what's left. Who are the real artists here? It's us. We fill in the picture from our own experience. We see their inner feelings. Pain, anxiety, encouragement, compassion, willpower. We can't help doing it. It's so easily done that we take this ability for granted Yet none of it would be possible if we weren't able first to look in on ourselves. What chance did the rest of unconscious nature have? Imagine the biological benefits to the first of our ancestors who developed the ability to make realistic guesses about the inner life of their fellow human beings, the ability to see other people as versions of themselves. Trust, cooperation, New forms of social organization became possible, and with it, the shared exploitation of the environment. Does all this mean we are alone on the planet? The only ones who have these thoughts and feelings, self-awareness, self-knowledge, insight into ourselves and others? Who's conscious and who isn't? Consciousness will not have evolved unless it's needed. If the inner eye evolved as a tool for doing psychology, then animals which don't need to do psychology don't need an inner eye. They don't need to be conscious. about the social insects. A beehive is an intricate community in which plenty of calculations must be made, but there's nothing psychologically complex here. Worker bees are so closely related to each other that individual problems, rivalry, jealousy, guilt and so on, just don't come in. The same must be true for most other animals on Earth. They don't need to be conscious, so the chances are they're not. Then which species, if any, are likely to have evolved an inner eye? Only those which need to sustain lasting, intimate and difficult relationships with one another. Some of the higher social mammals, dolphins, wolves, elephants, baboons, are promising candidates for consciousness. But their social arrangements are still primitive compared to the only animals we know are conscious, namely human beings themselves. 
The exception has to be chimpanzees. It's scarcely conceivable that these individuals are not self-aware, that they don't make imaginative guesses about what their fellow animals are feeling and thinking. Chimpanzees are capable of social wheeling and dealing at a level not found in any other animal. They're capable of deceit, cheating, cooperation, and altruism. Chimpanzees have been observed to weigh up situations as if from another chimpanzee's point of view, and to modify their own behavior on the basis of how they must appear to someone else. They seem not only to be self-aware, but aware that other chimpanzees are self-aware. There's another thing. Chimpanzees can recognize their own reflection in a mirror. And that, it's been argued, is proof positive that they have an inner sense of self. When I see myself in a mirror, I know it's me. I'm well aware of the presence of myself behind that face. And I can use the mirror to show me what I look like. So can chimpanzees. But apart from the great apes, and maybe whales, all other species fail this mirror test, even dogs. Where does this leave me and my dog? I'd like to believe that he is conscious. But what I need is some kind of evidence that he can put his consciousness to use. Does he ever use his own mind as a model for understanding mine? He seems to feel so many human things, like guilt, hope, sadness. But does he ever use his awareness of those feelings to interpret my behavior? This journey that began with Helen may be leading to some uncomfortable conclusions. Descartes believed there were no other conscious animals on Earth. He went too far. Yet chimpanzees, gorillas, whales, those very species most likely to be our cousins in consciousness, are increasingly threatened by man's hand with extinction. Are human beings then destined to become conscious inhabitants of an otherwise totally unconscious world. It depends what you think about the potential of robots and computers. Human beings are destroying one kind of life, but they're creating others. I don't think we need worry, if worry is the right word, that any existing machine approaches consciousness. But why not, one day, a conscious machine? A robot with its own machine-based inner eye that inspects its own mind, its own thoughts, and shows insight into other robots like itself. Suppose we were to understand, as we don't now, the detailed physiology and programming of our own brains. Could we then play the role of God and give consciousness to inanimate machines? Wouldn't such conscious robots always be mere simulations, never the real thing? The computer plays chess well, but it has no feelings of its own, and it doesn't, of course, know anything of mine. Yet, strangely enough, it helps me to think I am playing against a conscious human adversary. I can imagine the computer wants to beat me, that it's trying to conceal its own intentions, and it's hoping to trick me into making a false move. This sentimental fallacy may help me play a better game. Perhaps it isn't always a mistake to see consciousness where logically it doesn't belong. No one gives us permission to attribute consciousness even to other human beings. But from childhood on, we learn to do it 
because in practice it works wonders for our understanding of how other people think and act. If it works wonders for our understanding of the non-human world as well, so much the better. The mystic, the poet, or any ordinary person who animates nature by the power of his own mind and feels himself in sympathy with every living thing is not in error. For nothing which helps us to relate to and interpret our environment can be an error. To understand what Nick Humphrey's saying, I think you've got to understand what he's reacting against. There's a view around that consciousness is private, it's an inner world to which each person has sole access, and it's somehow supernatural, it lifts us above nature. Now, Nick Humphrey's saying, on the contrary, this is a Darwinian age, we've got to think in naturalistic terms, we've got to explain all human mental capacities as products of evolution, as Darwin himself knew would have to come, and therefore, consciousness has now got to be seen as social, it has to do with communication, and it's a natural phenomenon. All biological questions must be approached in a Darwinian framework. It is the Darwinian framework that makes sense of everything about life, and consciousness, quite clearly, is a manifestation of life. So that's the first thing. He's obviously approaching the question in the right way because he's asking a Darwinian kind of question. I must say, I do like the particular answer that he gives within the Darwinian framework too, if only because it has to me the feeling of being big enough to do a difficult job. I mean, we've got a very difficult problem. Consciousness is, I suppose, the outstanding problem remaining for biology. And just as Darwin's solution to the problem of how we all got here must have had the smell of being big enough to do the job at the time, so this has to me the feeling of being a big theory for a big problem. Well, I think it's a philosophical theory rather than at this stage something that's uh, obviously uh, uh, testable by experiment. Um, it seems to me a good and useful theory of a certain kind of consciousness, um, which is explicitly self-consciousness or self-awareness. I think that's what his thesis is about, actually. Um, it's about the consciousness of self, and I, I think he makes a very good case out uh, for his thesis that probably only human beings and certain other animals, chimpanzees perhaps, have this form of self-awareness. We become aware of other people when we learn language, and particularly when we learn to use the pronouns, I, me, myself, mine, you, yours, and so on. And I think consciousness arises out of language because we use language in order to draw other people's attention to our desires, our wants, our projects, our intentions, and so forth. And we've got to get other people's cooperation in order to survive. Although you may need to have a fairly sophisticated brain to outsmart a predator or prey, you need, and I think this is probably Nick Humphrey's main point, you need an even smarter brain in order to outsmart another human being. And why you should want to outsmart another human being is because they're rivals. They're the most severe rivals you have in, in any species. Most of selection is between members of the same species. So the enemy is very largely members of one's own species. They are rivals for resources, for mates, for status, and so on. And if those rivals are themselves exceedingly complicated beings, and therefore, in order to outsmart them, you need to be able to be one jump ahead in a very sophisticated and complicated way. Then his theory of the inner eye looking in upon your own brain and working out what the other person might do by looking in at yourself and saying, well, what would I do in those circumstances, does seem, as I say, to have the ring of sense. We start out with uh, a fairly simple term like uh, conscious. We know what being conscious means. It means not being asleep or... Uh, not being, not being dead. Um, and then uh, we create an abstract noun from it, consciousness, and we've immediately got a thing that we start to look for. And uh, if people go wandering around in the brain with electrodes, looking 
for consciousness and failing to find it, they're, they're, they're simply in the position of somebody who, say, uh, wanders around in the House of Commons uh, looking for government and failing to find it. Now, it's not the sort of thing that you would expect to find in, in, in the brain. It's just an abstract noun that uh, the language uh, has created. I have no idea what an inner eye would actually look like. I mean, it clearly isn't an organ with a lens and a retina that you can dissect out of the brain in the way that you can dissect out the eye that's looking outwards. I don't think I really have a view about what the inner eye actually means, and I'm not sure whether he does either. I do think that even before you start having to be a natural psychologist, any animal that needs to do fairly sophisticated computational job in order to get around its world is going to have to simulate a model of its world in its own head, a computer simulation. So when any animal looks at an object, I suggest that what it's doing is really looking at a simulated model of that object inside its head and is m performing manipulations upon that simulated object. A bat, for example, which, as you know, finds its way around by echoes, it lives in a purely sound world and can scarcely see at all, if I were to try to imagine what it might like to, what it might be like to be a bat, if we thought that bats had consciousness at all, then I suspect that it might be very like seeing for us. I think that when, when a bat hears its way around a room, what it has to do is to set up a simulated model which is convenient for finding its own way around in three-dimensional space. And the kind of model that you need for finding your way around three-dimensional space is the same whether the information that you use to set up that model comes in in the form of light rays or sound waves. So that's just setting up the idea that many an animal may have, in some sense inside its head, a computer simulation of its world. Now that doesn't mean that it would be a conscious simulation. It doesn't mean that it would be a conscious imagining of the world in the same way as Nick Humphrey is talking about. But I suppose it might in some sense be an evolutionary precursor. If you've already got a model of the outside world, which you're using to guide your way around it, the next step would be to place your own body in that model of the three-dimensional world. And I suppose it's but one further step to turn inwards and model the actual thought processes itself, to have a model of the model. One of the things that's happened since Darwin is that we've got an enormously stronger sense of our solidarity with the whole of the animal and plant kingdoms. The animals really are our kin. Of course, we've got a lot of inherited attitudes to animals. We keep some as pets, we eat others, we kill some as vermin, we put some in zoos and so on. We've got a chaotic set of rules for dealing with animals inherited from the past, and we've not yet worked out a new ethic for the way we treat animals. I think that'll have to come, and it'll have to be more in touch with the facts of evolutionary biology. Notice how Nick stressed that our treatment of whales and the primates has been particularly bad. We've been exterminating them, and yet these are the creatures who in their capacities are perhaps closest to ourselves. It does worry me if anybody took this idea as a license for being unkind to other species, if anybody thought, well, it's only a machine, so it doesn't matter what we do with it, we can stick hooks through it or whatever it is. At the very least, it seems to me, we should give animals the benefit of the doubt whenever the po possibility arises. We should remember that a Martian visiting Earth, looking at our behavior, might come to the same conclusion about us. And although I do find great force in Nick Humphrey's argument that we are a species that needs to do natural psychology and therefore that's probably why we've got it. I'm only really convinced that we have consciousness because I know I've got it. And the argument for you having it is an argument by analogy. I find a little bit lame the suggestion that it's possible to just look at the behavior of, say, chimpanzees and say, well, yes, obviously they must have consciousness and dogs not. Uh, I think it's much more difficult to decide which species might need to be natural psychologists and which species might not need to be natural psychologists. And as far as actual conduct is concerned, I'm all for giving them the benefit of the doubt. I hope for his sake uh, that he's, he's right. Um, a, a, a contemporary of, of Descartes, 
claimed that uh, um, the philosopher had to be correct because if he'd been wrong and animals really did have conscious experiences, they'd have been so indignant about his theories that they would have risen up and torn him to pieces. So uh, from that point of view, uh, the theory had better be right or the author of it's in trouble. Um, it clearly oughtn't to matter uh, to our moral feelings about animals. Um, they, uh, whether or not they're conscious, uh, we don't have uh, their, if we believe that they're unconscious, it doesn't give us a license to treat them in any different manner from the way that we treat them now. Um, I think the fundamental point there is that uh, because we have this very strong tendency as human beings to attribute emotions and feelings to animals, it matters terribly much how we treat them um, because of the way other people will feel about that. Um, it might be a delusion that uh, they have feelings, but uh, it's not a delusion that many people have strong feelings about animals, and uh, that clearly ought to be respected. Could you ever build a machine that was conscious? I know that I'm conscious. I know that I'm a machine. Therefore, it seems to me, and, and I know that there's nothing special. I mean, I, perhaps I could say I have faith, but I think I almost know that there is nothing in my brain that couldn't, in principle, be simulated in a computer. So if you took the extreme policy of building a computer that was an exact simulation of a human brain, doing everything that a human brain does, a point-for-point -point mapping from human brain anatomy to uh, computer hardware, then, of course, such a machine would have to be conscious, and be conscious in just the same sense as I know that I'm conscious. That's a different matter from saying it'll ever be done. It could be formidably difficult to, it certainly would be formidably difficult to do that precise reconstruction of a sort of computer version of a human brain. Would it ever happen that computers in actual commercial use get sufficiently complicated that consciousness kind of emerges? I don't know. I mean, Nick Humphrey presumably would say no unless it became commercially important for computers to second guess what humans or other computers were thinking. If it did, then I presume his line would be that's the moment when they would need to become conscious. Other people might feel that mere complexity itself, if you advance the complexity of a computer on any system to a sufficiently high degree, then consciousness will gradually start to emerge. I've, as I've said before, I, I'm inclined to agree with Nick Humphrey about his theory of consciousness, and so I suppose my feeling is that computers will be conscious either if people take the step of trying to precisely mimic a human brain with a computer, or if it becomes economically, commercially important to make computers capable of predicting the behavior of humans or of other computers in highly complex social ways. <laughs>